Alrighty. Howdy, friends. Welcome back for another exciting episode of learning about the wild world of cybersecurity. I am your host, Haley. And, um, I don't think anyone's here, but that's okay because in the, f the, the future people that are watching this and un unearthing this are, uh, very excited to learn about cybersecurity. And actually it looks like we have one viewer. So hello viewer and all of the rest of you that have joined us. Uh, so this episode is just sort of a bit of a wrap up of what we've been talking about. I, s I honestly do have just very few things I want to touch on. I'll even show you how few slides I have uh, for this lesson. Uh, but uh, yeah, just uh, the fourth episode of each season is meant to just be kind of a review of what we went over. Um, I think because we only have one person here, we may not be doing uh, the... Oh, actually, maybe there's more than one viewer because Pixelmoth and Negihama said hello. Hello, my friends. So maybe we can do the review because I do have a prize for, oh, nice green screen. Took that all out. Uh, it's called the Operator Handbook. Um, it's a combination of a bunch of things, but uh, the red team field manual and the blue team field manual. And uh, just gives a lot of really handy uh, command line tricks for doing cool stuff. So uh, let's go over to my computer. Uh, that's a secret. And uh, you you all know this part. You are your teacher. I'm just a red-haired lady on the internet uh, that has some resources that I think are very helpful. And we can sort of build building blocks to uh, achieve a career in cybersecurity, perhaps, or perhaps just uh, a little more awareness about what happens in that field. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to wrap things up for you with a few security stories. Um, I think these are two really cool stories um, that they mainly happened when I was a, a budding cybersecurity professional, but um, they, I still think they're two of the coolest stories of the past five years. And uh, there have been quite a few since then, but these have a lot of interesting threads that we'll talk about. But before all that, uh, let's uh, do the, I guess it's the, I mean, it's still a quiz, but uh, we'll do the Kahoot. Uh, so let me start up the Kahoot. I at least know Negihama and Pixelmoth are here. Hello, my friends. You might uh, be competing head to head um, for the review. All right, so if there's anyone else viewing, and I guess this viewer count on my phone thing is not accurate, so uh, basically you just go to kahoot.it, type in 364-501, and then you'll be in the lobby here, and uh, yeah, we'll just review some of the things we went over this month, and uh, the lucky slash dedicated and persistent winner. Will achieve a copy of this super awesome book. There's all sorts of fascinating things in here. There's a chapter on open source intelligence or OSINT. Uh, we got plops in here. Um, but the OSINT uh, chapter, almost there, the M. So close. N. Ah! So there's a ton of useful resources for looking up people on the internet, <laughs> uh, which is a fascinating thing to do. Um, you know, it's interesting. And I was, I was going for a graduate degree in cyber intelligence before I got hired. And then I was like, wow, this is a lot of work. Um, and I picked someone that was like a, a friend of my father's back in the day, I suggest looking for anyone under 40 because there's a lot less digital data about, uh, uh, I don't want to say older generations, but generations of a less technological era. Era. Uh, Negihama, are you going to join in? I, uh, I saw you in the chat there. 
um, it's your opportunity to win fabulous prizes on top of the glory. But it might be a Pixamoth and Ploppo uh, head-to-head. My mother <laughs> is not in the competition this time. You don't have to worry about her uh, taking your glory. But uh, I don't know, Negyama might be busy and can't join the cahoots. I'll give another 20 seconds. Otherwise, it's a, oh, there she is. All right, I, I'm pretty sure this is the crew. This is this is the team. So I'm going to click the button. Okay, here it goes. Um, so if you're following along at home, the answers will be on the bottom here and match up with either your phone or your laptop uh, with the uh, question up on the screen. I'll make it full screen. What are the primary attacker motives? Is it to bother you personally? Because how dare you? Gather information? Getting money? Or just boredom? It's not, not much else to do. So might as well hack some people on the internet. Yep, yep. Gathering information, getting money. Sorry if you didn't get an answer in. I know that, that one had a 20 second timer. I think I got to make it all of them at least 30 seconds. But uh, yeah, information is basically money. So th those are the two things that they can use to their advantage. Oh, three people still. I don't know. Uh, Open-ended. What country is APT1 tied to? We talked about, uh, in episode two, attacker mindset and methods. We went over some of the APTs. Um, I'll give you a hint. There's three primary APTs to be worried about. That's us, the United States, <laughs> Russia, and China. North Korea is another one. We'll actually be talking about North Korea uh, in this episode. Uh... True or false, the incident response cycle varies wide, widely. People just do whatever. There's no rhyme or reason to any of this security protocol and incident response protocol. It's all made up on the spot. Who knows what's happening? Um, yeah, no, that, that's not the case. We, we went over uh, the, the five-phase... Uh, National Institute Science and of Science and Technology, NIST 861's uh, incident response process. And there's also SANS Pickerel, which is preparation, investigation, containment, eradication, recovery, and lessons learned. And the NIST one just sort of combines a few of those together. And then I made my own. That was just four steps. Uh, in what order... Would an attacker perform a cybersecurity breach? Uh, would they recon first? Or would they collect first? Or are they trying to get persistence first? And that last one is ugh, exfiltration. I swear it says X. This is not ideal. I can't escape. I'm trapped by lights. The green one behind me is exfiltration. Uh, and, uh, who knows? I mean, ex exfiltration, it sounds like the last thing you would do. Um, but yeah, the correct order here is recon, then they're getting persistence, then they're collecting things they want, and then they're exfiltrating out of the network. Alrighty. Uh, Negihama's still in the lead. Uh, true or false, the United States does not have an APT group. We are not an advanced persistent threat. We're just an advanced persistent freedom fighter, um, but not not a threat. We don't we don't do that APT stuff. That's all North Korea, Russia, and China. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's not true. <laughs> the, if you remember from the lesson, the the one that uh, the shadow brokers exposed, they dubbed the equation group because of the really advanced cryptography um, found in some of those uh, attacker tools. Uh, what are some social engineering techniques? Uh, we've got the USB drop. Oh, another 20 seconds. Good luck. Credential harvesting, business email compromise, and insecure configurations. Sorry, I forgot I didn't 
check the timers on all of these before I started. But looks like we got some points in there. Yeah, these these three here. The USB drop, uh, one of the most successful attacks, still works like a charm. Just throw some USB drives in a parking lot. Eventually someone will pick one up and it'll beacon out to your command and control server. Credential harvesting is just sort of getting people to click on stuff. And uh, business email compromise, making it look like it's from the boss. Insecure configurations is more more something you would take advantage of if it existed. That's kind of more technical and less of a social engineering tactic. True or false, it's better to perfect one security solution than utilize many. I mean, why even... I mean, how are you going to develop a bunch of security solutions? I mean, really? I mean, probably only do one. Yes, that's that's false. The, we talked in uh, episode three about the concept of defense in depth. So we want to insert as many layers of security where we can to uh, keep attackers out. Oh, Pixel Moth coming up. Nagihama right on top, though. I don't know, folks. We'll see. Pixel can come back. Or Plops. What are some top 10 web app phones? Ooh, another 20 seconds. Better go quick. Uh, insufficient monitoring. Broken authentication. SQL injection or malware attacks. I mean, those are all attacks, that's for sure. But only three of those were in the OWASP top 10. Uh, malware attacks, there, there is malware that takes advantage of vulnerabilities that are uh, of externally facing uh, web apps, but uh, primarily SQL inje injection. This one has been basically number one years running. And... Uh, all it takes is for coders to remember to secure their code. Uh, true or false? Standards are mandatory controls. And well, it's if it's a standard, does that sound like you would, or is it just a guideline where it's kind of like, well, hmm. So a guideline sounds non-mandatory. So a standard is mandatory. Nice. Good job, y'all. All right, open-ended. What organization releases a top 10 list of web vulnerabilities? Uh, we talked kind of about these, but I didn't name the organization this time. So maybe if it's in your brain somewhere, it starts with O, and then it's an animal with a stinger that's not a bee and not a hornet. <laughs> It's the O O wasp. Yes, uh, that's it's it's really fascinating to just look at that every year and uh, and just see what they say about how to detect it, how it gets exploited, etc. So forth. Uh, what are some operational Controls. Okay, my head's not in the way of anyone. Security awareness training, incident response, a firewall, or a badge reader. So operational, again, is more like what you do or policy that guides human behavior um, because the others are physical and technical. So operationally, what of these sort of like describes how we actually do something? Yep. So that's security awareness training. You're, you're training your employees how to operate in response to phishing emails and how other ways their trust can be abused. And an incident response uh, protocol is uh, how you respond to incidents. A firewall is a technical control because it's ultimately a tech thing you use to keep things out. And a badge reader is a physical control because uh, you physically install it to keep your place secure. Oh, Negi Hama, I think uh, they're on a streak. They might be uh, bringing it home. Uh, human trust is easier to exploit than network defenses. But we all know humans are very powerfully... Well, I mean, <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, human trust is much easier to exploit. And that's why uh, a study that came out in 2018 said... 
about 95% of uh, large-scale attacks the inter- against enterprises um, started with a phishing email because it's much easier to get inside the network with a fish than it is to hammer on secure protocols on the outside of the network that are meant to keep attackers out. Uh, all right, quiz, multi-options. What are some critical thinking questions we can use to build a mental model? And this was in the, the first episode we were talking about critical thinking. Oh man, 20 seconds again, my apologies. Uh, is this information accurate? Is that last one? But uh, just questions we can ask to approach things from a different manner or maybe find out how truthful our, our mental model, model actually models reality. So yeah, all of these are, what is the frame of reference? That's a helpful thing to think about. What information do I need? Is this information accurate? And what am I assuming? All of these great questions to whenever you're approaching a problem to sort of like think around the problem. So you're not just coming at it from one angle. All right, Plop's coming in. The best way to understand malware is to watch it carefully and run it directly on your machine. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you you could do that. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm glad all y'all answered. Uh, you definitely want to at least put it in a VM. There are some malware that can break out of a VM. Very, very rare, and usually that's like state-level stuff. But uh, usually running in a VM is probably fine. Oh, another puzzle. Everyone hates these. And <laughs> Hopefully I gave enough time for this one. Order of a standard incident response life cycle. Okay, there are 60 seconds. So that last one, God, I can't... There's nothing I can do. It says contain. Uh, there we go. Contain. So learn, detect, prepare, contain. Uh, so yeah, what would you put that order in? Learning, detecting, preparing, or containing? Sounds like there's a... Uh, yeah, there is an ideal order to this. Most of them have... Uh, Preparation first, that's where you're setting up defenses, that sort of thing. Detect is finding the bad thing. Contain often gets looped in with uh, eradication and recovery. And lastly, you learn from what you from what you found so that you can prepare better for next time. So that your incident response cycle is constantly improving your security posture. All right. Yeah, sorry for the puzzles. I'd I think the app is not well designed for making those intuitive. Uh, what are some physical security controls? So remember, we went over operational, which is like human training. Uh, physical is things that exist in physical space to uh, enable security. And technical, which is a purely uh, tech-based solution to institute security. Yeah, so got most of them there. Cameras, for sure, are a physical thing. I mean, technically they are tech, but they are not tech that is causing a block. Um, it is tech that uh, can be used for security purposes. Uh, firewall is tech that is causing things to uh, be secure. Play agreement is operational. You're telling employee how to, how to behave themselves with uh, network resources. And ID cards, again, it's a physical thing that uh, helps improve security. Whoa, Nagihama pulling ahead, but Pixelmop is catching up. It's a close one. The easiest way to access an internal network is from attacking the external network. Hmm. I know we just said that uh, human trust was easy to abuse. And yes, that's because the external network is designed with security in mind, so you'd have to be incredibly negligent to have none of those controls in place. But uh, training your employees on phishing? There's a lot less of that happening. 
So, uh, yeah. Oh, Pixel came in second. Got three questions left. Uh, we'll see what happens. Multi-select, this times two to points. What are some log sources for a SIM? That's a security information event manager. We've got event logs, intrusion detection system logs, physical access logs, and endpoint logs. I mean, a SIM is basically just a big log vacuum. Um, so I don't know. I mean, those all say logs on them. And yeah, I mean, the physical access one, I was, yeah, I was throwing it in there to kind of be cheating because, uh, you wouldn't think, you know, it's, it's not always in your mindset as a security professional. We don't check those as often, but that becomes really handy for like, did this person badge in to work before their computer got connected from an IP, uh, that they're, it's really unfamiliar. Um, so physical access logs can be useful for security information. Whoa! All right, Negi, Hama, and Pixelma got mad points. Plop still in the game. But uh, I think, I don't know, can't see the future, but I have an educated guess. The amount of cybercrime and cyberterrorism is leveling out and likely won't increase much further. Uh, so this we talked about in the second episode where I showed a graph. That's right. It's going to get much worse. I showed a graph of the number of Internet of Things devices, which we will talk about an Internet of Things botnet uh, in a moment. But uh, regulation is getting better, but the amount of devices that are getting introduced, and especially when we have 5G and everything can connect to it and utilize that bandwidth, uh, is more of an attack surface. What organization releases the 861 security guidelines? It's a tough one. But that's why I put it at the end. That is a national institute of some kind that deals with uh, nerdy stuff. Like science and technology. You know, nerd stuff. And some sort of national institute of some kind. The NIST. Yes. Uh, ISO is a good one, too. Uh, they, they do, I think, what is ISO? That's for credit card data? Uh, it's some sort of security policy org. It might just be security audit in general. All right. Welp. Uh, we've got props in third place. Pixel month in second. And dun 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 dun, Nagehama, the uh, fabulous winner of the Operator Handbook. So, Nagehama, feel free to reach out to me, um, or I can poke you, um, and we can get this your way. It's super cool just to read through and read about the various commands, but also just to have handy when you're doing hacker stuff. Um, it's It's got a lot in there. So awesome. Thank you all so much for joining. You're all heroes in, in my mind for learning anything about cybersecurity from me. So uh, yeah, thanks y'all. Uh, how did I get five emails in the last 15 minutes? All right. So just a real quick lesson. And then I got like 20 minutes on the back end uh, for just hanging. But uh, yeah, so we did the recap. Congrats again, Nagihama. Uh, so I just wanted to go over three things real quick. Uh, the WannaCry ransomware. This was 2017. Uh, the Mirai botnet, which was 2016. And staying up to date. And just my general recommendations on all of that. So uh, the WannaCry ransomware. So sit back and listen to a tale of... Uh, that has ups and downs and intri national intrigue and personal loss. Um, but uh, we talked briefly in uh, episode two about the Shadow Brokers releasing these a uh, tool set by whom they whom they dubbed the Equation Group, which is 
definitely probably 99.9% certain the NSA, because the names of those tools matched up with some of the tools that Edward Snowden mentioned in his leaks. And they did the thing that they said they do. Um, the NSA got a lot of flack, uh, for not, <laughs> not telling vendors of American companies that they had exploits and backdoors to their, you know, their own tools. And one of those was a, an exploit called Eternal Blue, which was a server message bus. SMB is a, is a protocol that, uh, Windows machines, I mean, Linux and, uh, OS X can use it as well. But it is it is mostly a file sharing protocol, um, so it allows Windows computers to talk to each other on a network. And Eternal Blue allowed uh, just sort of access to to implant a file somewhere. And there was another exploit in, uh, packaged with uh, Eternal Blue with WannaCry uh, called Wow IBM defined SMB in the eighties. That's wild. I had no idea. So yeah, it's been around for a long time. I'm I'm sure there's been, you know, more security implemented with like Kerberos authentication and that sort of thing. But uh yeah, who knows how long this exploit was actually working because who knows how long the NSA actually had it and just didn't tell Microsoft. The problem being, someone else could have made the exact same exploit and Microsoft would never know um until, you know, a high profile attack. Uh so uh Shadow Brokers released these tools. Uh, we saw Eternal Blue and another one called Double Pulsar, which allowed execution <laughs> on another computer, which uh, normally you would need a computer to somehow execute the thing that you implanted there with Eternal Blue. But these two things together was a really brutal technique. And so WannaCry combined both of these. So as soon as it got into a Windows network, it just spread along all the file shares and executed on every machine it had access to. So it was, I mean, when this thing popped off, uh, I don't remember exact numbers. Did I, did I write down exact numbers? I didn't, but, uh, I mean, I think that there was a huge impact to the, uh, national health service in the UK where a number of hospitals were shut down very quickly. Uh, and, and it just, it was spreading like wildfire, wildfire in that one day that it had sort of just, it. And maybe it was going for a few days before that, before it peaked and like really hit some networks where it had high transmission rates, but, uh, it was going real bad. And, uh, uh, well, we could get into ransomware later, uh, regardless, um, a, uh, brave little researcher, uh, his, his Twitter Twitter handle is malware tech. He reverse engineered the malware, started looking at the code, and he saw this strange, like, string, like, check for blah, 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 dot com. And it looks like if that website was reached, then the malware would not, uh, execute the ransom, which is a very strange behavior because <laughs> most ransomware authors don't care and they want your money, so they're not going to do that. Uh, but, so he just, he looked for that website. It was not registered. I mean, it was just a string of randomness. So he registered the website and WannaCry stopped executing. So this is what's called a kill switch. And it's, it's very strange for, for a ransomware to have a kill switch. But what was interesting about WannaCry's sort of tactic in general was that, uh, not only did it have not a very good, like, user-friendly way to pay the ransom, which a lot of ransomware nowadays, it's like a customer service experience. You get better experience with the ransomware authors that, or the ransomware people on the other end uh, about how to use Bitcoin and, like, how to get this money. Like, they have a very consumer-friendly product, and that was somewhat in existence in 2017, but this one was just very badly managed. There were just four Bitcoin addresses that it set up and just gave you a list. They had to manually verify you actually paid to like give you a decryption key, which goes to show they probably didn't care. And it made very little money for how much damage it did. But what uh, researchers found when studying it afterwards is that they placed this with North Korea, which someone mentioned earlier as one of the APTs. Um, this uh, group is called Lazarus Group, and it utilized a lot of the same code, it had uh, the 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 character keyboard uh character set for uh korean 
And, uh, I mean, that could be false flag, you know, trying to plant evidence like, oh, someone else did it. But uh, that very rarely happens. And there are a lot of other indicators. The indicator is North Korea. And, uh, I mean, we're not exactly, I mean, <laughs> our person is a little friendly with the dictator of North Korea. But uh, especially in 2017, we weren't exactly super friendly with them. And, I th and it's speculated that they may have just wanted the U.S. to look bad that let's cobble together a malware made by their government and then hit them with it. Uh, so it's like hitting themselves with their own uh, hand and just making us look bad because it didn't look like it was meant to make, uh, get money, uh, which is very rare for ransomware because it was not set up well to do so. So uh, yeah, likely North Korea. Um, the story about poor malware tech, uh, he was a hacker in younger days, uh, but he got some uh, attention from, you know, figuring out this sinkhole and he got taken in by the FBI, da 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 da, da. There's a beautiful story about the tech community coming in to help him um, with legal defense um, by two lovely humans uh, that I will tell you about. And uh, yeah, it's just a really fascinating story. And so it had a few variants, but the second one came out with a kill switch. Uh, <laughs> makes me want to rewatch the interview. Yeah, just because. Uh, that that was probably, I don't remember what the movie release date was around that, but that probably wasn't helping things either. Um, but uh, yeah, WannaCry came out with that first batch, had a kill switch. Second batch, uh, now the security community was al alerted to this because of malware tax work. Um, and so someone registered the new kill switch domain. Third variant had another kill switch. And then finally, the fourth variant didn't have a kill switch. But at that point, uh, most places had patched, even though, you know, the patch came out weeks before this attack. Getting a patch actually in is rare. So that's WannaCry. Super fascinating story. I've got links at the end for a little more information on that. Uh, next is the Mirai botnet. So this one is also super fascinating. So this was uh, mid, um, like quarter three, 2016. And uh, a botnet, if you're not super familiar, is just a like a zombie army of computers or devices that you utilize for a distributed denial of service attack. So these, if you give them, like you have a little herder that herds all these bots and you tell them, hey, hit these IP addresses with everything you've got, just flood them with traffic. And, again, and there's different ways to flood with traffic, but but that's the general idea of a botnet. So before Mirai, I think the top uh, throughput of of like network data being slammed against uh, some sort of network was 50 gigabytes per second. That's a lot of network data. That's a lot. But Mirai came around, and its first initial launch was 1.1 terabits per second. That's what, 10, 20, 50 times more powerful than, than that, uh, the previously, uh, top of the chart attack. So this was like, that's why I call it the thermonuclear option there, because it was like thermo thermonuclear weapons showing up on the scene and no one being prepared for it. So, I mean, this thing was taking down internet infrastructure, like, uh, the security community was kind of in a big Everyone sharing data about how to fight it because when it hits something, it hits something real hard. Um, it brought down a number of popular websites like Facebook and some Google services, um, I think, and Twitter, um, as well as just a bunch of sites in general because they hit a uh, an internet backbone by a company DYN DIN, um, which provides a lot of like backbone internet services for big providers. So they hit DIN. DIN got taken down, taking down all of these big companies. Uh, and then uh, Brian Krebs, a tech journalist, his website was targeted and was taken down for four days straight. And he even had DDoS prevention by, I think, Cloudflare or maybe it was Akamai. But, and they were providing the service to him to try and like help his website. And they just gave up because they were like, we can't keep up. We are spending so much money to try and fend off this DDoS attack that we can't. And they just let Brian's website get wrecked. <laughs> uh, so funny thing. So Brian Krebs was maybe digging a little deeper than he should have because he started doing sort of the people investigation of like, who is likely capable of this? Um, so there was a person uh, on a like a darknet forum named Anna Senpai. Uh, so they clearly like anime. 
and uh, they named it Mirai after an anime. And uh, they were bragging sort of about this, how powerful their botnet was and uh, all this. And so he started doing a little digging and he saw some interesting correlations between what they said, like, oh, I'm proficient in C, Go, PHP, da 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 And they put out this string. Brian Krebs found that on someone's LinkedIn. And interestingly... They ran a DDoS protection service. And very interesting, they went to Rutgers University, and Rutgers was experiencing DDoS attacks during uh, qu like quarterlies and finals and uh, student registration, and they just had to spend some money on DDoS protection, and it just so happened to go to a previous student. Uh, so, uh, Brian Krebs didn't even know about the Rutgers stuff at the time, but he started posting his articles about what he had dug up on these this individual. And uh, that uh, got a target on his back. Uh, and so kind of confirmed what happened, but then the FBI started looking into things and found two more accomplices. I think one other one of, one of them was also a Rutgers student and the other one just someone else they had recruited for more development on the botnet. But it was a very genius idea to take advantage of how insecure generally Internet of Things devices are, um, where they'll, you know, poke holes in a home network so that the microwave can talk to your phone, whatever. And uh, and then if they can be hit and be given a default username and password, probably nobody changed the password. I think there was 300,000 devices on it, like, and real quickly, too. Um, and now... It's interesting because this was one of the first botnets of, it, of its kind with all the Internet of Things devices. There has never been a botnet quite as powerful because now, now that people are aware that's a strategy to like pwn Internet of Things devices. Now there's, there's a few botnets sort of like fighting for control of the other ones. And there's even people releasing code that takes over a machine to patch it so, so that it can't be attacked by these larger botnets. Uh, yeah, imagine getting DDoS by a light bulb. Exactly. Uh, JMS. Uh, that's, that's really funny. Yeah, your light bulb uh, got, gotcha. Took down Amazon. Um, but yeah, Mariah's fascinating. And what's the, I mean, I, I'll post a, a, sto a link to a story about it, uh, but it's fascinating because they were originally using it to DDoS Minecraft servers because they had competition in the Minecraft game. Because there were servers where people set up and then people paid for subscriptions to the Minecraft servers that had all these great mods and were set up really well and communities and stuff. So they would just DDoS Minecraft server competitors. <laughs> and then they just built a really good DDoS tool. So uh, Minecraft causes DDoS. That's what we figured out. Uh, anyway, that's another fascinating story and I suggest reading all about it because it's really cool. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to really quickly, oh, and thank you all for, for following. I'm excited to, to have you, uh, moving forward. And, uh, yeah, so staying up to date, I think as a security professional, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that you have to work at home all the time, but you can, you can insert security into the things you normally look at. So it becomes kind of normal for you to, uh, to, to be, be faced with. Uh, some of the information security news because it is always changing. Like that Mariah and WannaCry thing, that was like a top security story. I mean, there's the Equifax breach in 2018. That was another big one. Target breach, uh, Sony breach, I think that was 2014. Uh, there was another one by North Korea in 2016. Uh, so like there's lots of these cool big stories that make it into, you know, CNN, MSNBC, da 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 da. Um, but there's, there's tons of little stories going on too. Uh, and just being exposed to the world of security, I think it, it, it rounds out your picture of how complex and wild this world is and how wild it's going to be. So if you, if you want to get into the field, it's a good idea to stay abreast of what's happening so that you can talk with, with some idea of what, what happened. You know, a lot of it's going to be gobbledygook, but uh, I think, you know, keeping up is, is really handy to help you learn because you're going to learn about what you can get into. So my number one recommendation for information security is Twitter. We all know Twitter can be a cesspool, but the information security community in general is actually super duper cool. The way I describe it is that it's a bunch of curious people sharing the curious things they found and uh, they're just enjoying what they do. 
and it's generally a not toxic, generally, so uh, group, but, uh, you know, lots of people just sharing interesting things. Oh, why is one of my names on there? Oh, there she is. So, uh, Swift on security. It's a parody account. It's meant to be Taylor Swift as if she was a security professional. Granted, uh, she clearly has a lot of experience in the field of security and, uh, she's just fun to listen to. She, and, and because she's such a huge following and releases, uh, wonderful tools like her Sysmon configuration, um, and just provokes a lot of interesting thought in the security community. She's a great follow. Um, a lot of times you'll just get, she'll ask a question and a lot of, you know, high profile people feed answers back to the threads she starts. So you'll learn a lot just by, uh, following her, uh, hacker fantastic. I think they run uh, hacker house. Um, yeah, that's hacker fantastic. Uh, Hacker House is like a training, uh, infosec training and consultation firm. But uh, Hacker Fantastic, I really love just because of the the breadth of articles that they uh, retweet and uh, talk about. Uh, and again, they have a lot of followers uh, of very high profile people, so they find lots of interesting things, and you get some good conversation going. Uh, the next one, Deviant Olam. He is one of the people, him and his wife, Tara, it's just at Tara with an H. Um, they are the two people who paid for malware tech's uh, bail uh, when he was uh, like under FBI investigation and helped him and then arranged resources to get him a lawyer pro bono and all this stuff. And malware tech's the guy who helped us defeat WannaCry. He's a good boy. He was trying to be a good boy. He was a reformed hacker just trying to be a good boy. Um, so Devian Olam, he's awesome. His specialty is physical penetration testing and social engineering. So if you watch some of his videos on YouTube, he'll show you how to get inside all sorts of security measures. Uh, you, you know, just every type of door, how to hack them, automatic doors, you spray like aerosol in front, uh, like through the, the slit and the aerosol sets off the laser from the inside that so it opens. There's so many cool things Deviant Olam can teach you. And uh, so his videos are really great. And I just love following him because he's also a, a, a cool guy that uh, posts lots of cool stuff. And then lastly, Hacks for Pancakes. She's, uh, her name is Leslie Carhart. She is a industrial control systems security specialist. So that's like the electric grid or uh, nuclear energy, or uh, gas lines, or, you know, things that operate on these very ancient systems, but uh, they have to interact with modern networks, but they gosh darn better be secure. And, uh, you know, they, that's a scary world uh, because a lot of them aren't, or at least, you know, there's, there's just very, potentially very dangerous hacks for that stuff. Oh yeah, and that's what Plops does. Yeah, and, and it's all Plops' fault if if it all goes wrong. <laughs> but I'm sure Plops has excellent operational, technical, and physical security um, with everything he builds. But uh, yeah, she's another great follow. And she she asks a lot of questions about the sort of like the the nature of security and how we approach security. So, so lo lots of those questions that get lots of interesting responses. So I don't know if, if you're not familiar with Twitter, it's just great to follow some cool people because they're going to retweet some cool people. So you can just sort of like zone out on like digging into the cool people they talk about and the articles they mention. And you just spend hours on there looking up cool stuff and following cool people and finding hashtags to, to find more content in that vein. But uh, I think Twitter's the best place to, to get InfoSec content. Next up is blogs. Uh, again, <laughs> I have... Uh, that one hidden. Um, these are just great for deep dives, a little bit uh, more uh, room than 280 characters on Twitter. But uh, three of my recommendations there are Graham Cluley, uh, just I think he's a British fella, um, tech journalist and thought, what do you, thought influencer guy, but uh, he collects a lot of interesting content. Uh, Brian Krebs, I mentioned earlier, is a tech journalist who outed one of the Mar the Mirai Botnet authors and <laughs> thusly got DDoSed super hard. Um, and he's got a great book called uh, Spam Nation, which I highly recommend, which goes into the like criminal and I, I mean like mafia, Yakuza sort of like gang 
organized crime level spam operations and how they use spam as to like support their other uh, parts of the network. Super cool book. Uh, and then lastly is Bruce Schneier at Schneier.com. Schneier's been around in the game for ages. If you take the Security Plus certification, you'll read about one of the cryptographic protocols called uh, Blowfish. And he developed that, uh, I believe, at IBM, possibly Microsoft. Um, but uh, a lot of the f Blowfish, Two Fish, and there's another one, Redfish, Bluefish? I'm getting the Dr. Seuss mix up. But Schneier developed those, and he's just a really interesting guy. Uh, also talks a lot about the sort of like nature of security and how we approach it and how we approach it moving forward. Lastly are just like aggregators, which are kind of just news sites. Uh, especially the first two, Threat Post and Dark Reading, are very similar. There's also Hacker News. Um, where the, I mean, it is just literally like looking at a CNBC or CNN of just InfoSec stuff. There is endless content there. To, to me, it's like almost too much. I don't need to know about, you know, the ransomware in Boston, even though the ransomware in Boston was fascinating with how much money they spent to not pay the ransom. And they spent so much money trying to remediate without doing the ransom. And they may, uh, I don't know. It's its a, a topic up in the air of whether you should pay the ransom or not. But, uh, you know, on the attacker end, it behooves them to actually decrypt your stuff when you pay the ransom, because then they'll be more, be more likely to get paid. But there's a lot of people you don't, who don't think you should ever pay the ransom. And I mean, if you just had a good backup, you wouldn't have to pay the ransom. But uh, that's rare. And then lastly, uh, I really like peerlist.com. It's uh, kind of like a community site for, uh, yeah. Eleanor says, I think I'd go to the ends of the earth to not pay. And yeah, it feels really good. Like, no, I'm not going to pay you any money. How dare you? But uh, if that means, you know, if it's $50,000 to pay the ransom and have all your stuff back online versus... Uh, possibly losing a lot of your company data and having to rebuild it. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of employee hours to sort of make all this happen. And uh, yeah, or using very, very old backups. And I mean, just operationally making it work all again. It's, uh, you know, I, I get why people pay the ransom. Um, and lastly is Peerlist. Uh, so Peerlist is great because uh, lots of people write articles there from all different skill levels. So you'll find amateur, intermediate, and advanced people just talking about. You'll have CISOs talking about CISO stuff. You'll have people talking about like, I learned pen testing. This is how. Uh, so if you just go to Peerlist, make an account, and then register for a few like topics you want to follow, like maybe you're interested in forensics or penetration testing or uh, just security policy or whatever it is. Follow a few things, and then you'll get a digest every week of articles in that sphere. And uh, yeah, it's just a great website to just cruise around and find uh, interesting content from people at all different levels. So all that to say, that's the end. I told you that my lecture wouldn't be terribly long. It was only 25 minutes instead of the normal 45-50. <laughs> Uh, but uh, if you go to my website, sevendirectioncom slash curriculum, oh, I didn't update the link yet, but I shall. Um, the link, if you go to the blog uh, click of the website, uh, it will link to the episode four wrap up. And that's the Wired article on Mirai. It's a pretty long article, but uh, very interesting. Uh, next is the WannaCry ransomware on Wikipedia. I think that's just good to get the overview of how it worked and what the different pieces were, but there's there's so much to that story that you could read about on other sites. And lastly, the Wired article on WannaCry's unlikely hero, our friend MalwareTech, um, who was helped out by Deviant Olam that I mentioned earlier. That's a very long article, but I think it's super just, I find these stories of hackers interesting and like how they got started and what angle they came from. And I mean, it's kind of, you know, it's a cool story to, to find out what happened to someone who helped us out a lot and, you know, probably honestly, truly did save lives. I mean, someone else would have gotten to it eventually, but the, the fact of how much of the UK's healthcare in infrastructure got taken down in one day, uh, MalwareTech did a good thing. And so, yeah, that's all I got for this episode. I'll switch it over to chatting. Um, so I do has a discord. I don't know if anyone is on it, but I do have the ability, I believe, to get someone on. How do I? 
Sorry, computers. How do I uh, get the invite again here? I could swear it was... Oh, there it is. So I'll throw that in the Twitch chat. Um, but also, if someone else is in there, you feel free to join the class chat. Oh, deleted my cookies. Hi, Jace. Oh, golly. Oh, you don't see my screen, right? Okay, doing two-factor right now. Just don't watch. Uh, that's not my two-factor code. But, uh, yeah, I was... If any of y'all have any questions, you're going to throw them in the chat as well. And, uh, yeah. I mean, basically, if you're new here, it's just a cybersecurity channel. Uh, I just do content every week. I've got uh, season one on sort of like just prepping yourself to learn a new thing and like skills you can use to learn stuff because it's not just as simple as just putting a book in front of you and reading. There's lots of things you can do to like think about how you learn and, and things you can do and habits you can in, in uh, start up with yourself to, to help the learning process become a lot easier. In the second season, we've been going over cybersecurity stuff. Uh, first episode was on critical thinking, second on attackers, third on defenders, and now we're here on security stories. And uh, then next month is going to be doing tech stuff. And uh, I'll well, let me throw up the curriculum real quick. So I did put up. Uh, so the basic outline. I, oh, I did update the links, so you should be able to see the ep the episode links here on uh, episode four. So. Um, Season three, I wanted to talk uh, because not everyone's at the same level of tech skill sets. Um, and I think there's some important things we should go over to uh, sort of prime us for, for doing cybersecurity, which will be the next. Uh, I don't know what to call it yet. I'm doing this as season one through three as like a package like this is a class. And here's season one, two, three. Uh, let's learn InfoSec. And then I think the next one is going to be let's do InfoSec. So we'll actually be doing a little bit more of on the ground stuff. Um, oh yeah, Live Overflow, uh, Live Overflow's YouTube videos, um, Live Overflow, yeah, I follow them on Twitter, oh yeah, and they do the, the CTF challenges, yeah, it's really, it's really fun to watch them sort of take apart, uh, how to do various challenges, because especially CTFs, uh, thank you, uh, Eleanor, for, for mentioning Live Overflow, uh, they sort of take these online challenges and then sort of show you how they process through them. I think there's there's definitely a lot of value to watching, but I think to redo a lot of what they do and actually download the tools they use, get the files they were using or hit the website they're using and do the thing because it's like interesting to like, there's a learning component with doing that really helps, but watching someone do it can help because when you don't know where to start and like how you can attack something or break something apart, it really helps to watch someone do it. So yeah, Live Overflow is great. Uh, another good one here that they're subscribed to is Ipsec, um, who also does a lot of videos. And uh, these other ones I'm not as familiar with, but I imagine they're, they're similar. Um, but uh, yeah, so the next class will be Let's Do InfoSec. Uh, for now, season three, which is next month, we'll go over Google dorking and open source intelligence. So that's just gathering information on the internet, which I don't know if y'all, like y'all, I didn't realize I was gaining tech skills by troubleshooting <laughs> uh, my family Wi-Fi and doing everything for... I was just the family tech person, but I didn't know any tech stuff. I was just Googling any everything. If it had an error code, I would Google the error. And, you know, it's like we as security professionals are Googling constantly. Or maybe we're duck duck going because we don't want to give Google our data. But regardless, we're searching for information on the Internet to tell us how to do our jobs and verify things because there's really no way to hold it all in here. Um, so we'll go over Google dorking and what you can find just with Google. Uh, maybe we'll mess with Shodan uh, a little bit as well. Uh, then we'll go for autom automation and organization just to show, like, I think I'm trying to get across why computers are so cool. And that's because they can do stuff really, really fast. So if we can, if we can learn about uh, things about computers we can use to learn about how we might use them in a security context later. Um, I just want to go over like scripting and stuff. Um, 
Thoughts on Kali Linux? No, it's not out of scope. It's all it's all in scope. We're here for cybersecurity. And Kali Linux is awesome. Uh, I believe, is it KaliTutorials.com? Uh, there's, oh yeah, Kali Linux. I'm pretty sure this is the website. It has an endless amount of tutorials because Kali Linux is a Linux distribution. So it's basically just Linux packaged with a bunch of interesting tools you might want to use for security reasons. So, um, yeah, there's, there's a ton of different tools on Kali Linux. It can kind of be overwhelming to start with, but, uh, if you're really interested in that stuff, it can be fun just to pick a tool and just start learning about it and seeing what you can do with it. In the second episode, I use Kali with Metasploit to exploit myself. <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah, there's so many cool tutorials out there and yeah, Moisturkowski says definitely love computers for automation, home servers and telescope automation are my jams. Ooh, interesting. I'm not even sure what telescope automation means, but I imagine it's like automation upon automation that makes auto you automate the automation. That's what it sounds like. Telescope automation moisture. Does that sound right? But, uh, yeah, I do want to cover automation just to just introduce scripting and, and things that make things a lot easier to do. Um, star tracking. Oh, telescope automation. I get it. Automating telescopes. I was thinking like telescoping automation, automation, that automates automation that automates automation. Uh, oh, that's so cool. A laptop runs an images space while you sleep. That's awesome. And yeah, you've got some automation in place that makes that a lot easier than staying up all night with coffee and pressing a button every time. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, in episode three, uh, this one will get into a little bit of the technical details of like what happens when you type google.com. Like I press google.com and press enter. The website loads Google. Yes, that's true. But there are tons of things that happened in between me typing and the internet providing and my my network giving me the internet and the internet reaching out to the server and the server talking to me and me establishing a connection. There's so much going on that I just want to sort of break down that process because that's the kind of stuff we'll be talking about in the next class of let's do InfoSec. Um, so I did want to do one sort of technical class, but again, if you're interested in cybersecurity, I think it's a, it's a good a time as any to start studying for the CompTIA security plus uh, certification. And I recommend Professor Messer's YouTube videos I recommended last class. Uh, he's who I use to do all my studying for, for the Security Plus exam. And I just barely passed. But uh, Security Plus is kind of the, the, the lowest bar slash gold standard uh, for intro to InfoSec jobs. So um, that's that gives an overview of the security organization. You're going to need technical skills and abilities. And that's sort of what like live overflow teaches and what you can get by doing Kali. And that sort of stuff is going to supplement what you know about the organizational sort of structural elements of security. You learn with the security plus. <laughs> uh, I like your, your haiku Moisturkowski. It's not DNS. There's no way it was DNS. It was DNS. Yeah, that's uh, DNS is one of those things that uh, I mean, it's got to be working just fine, right? There's there's nothing that could be causing that uh, and not DNS. Uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate the haiku. And uh, yeah, thank you for joining. Thank you for following uh, all these new folks. Uh, it's about up at the hour and it's really hot in my room because I turned the fan off so that the mic doesn't pick it up because I bought a sensitive mic because I'm being all fancy, but then it's so sensitive that it picks up the, on the fan and I don't want to use my AC because I get charged peak electricity in the summer. So I'm going to bid you all adieu. It was an absolute pleasure. And, uh, yeah, I'll be back next week. We'll be going over, uh, Google dorking and open source intelligence gathering. I think we'll throw Shodan.io in there as well so we can scan for vulnerable webcams on the internet. I'll see if we can, <laughs> actually, no, we're not, we're not, I was gonna like, I'll see if we can hack into a webcam and look in someone's webcam. And I was like, wait, no, I can't say that. And no, I've never done that. And no, I would never would, but you can. And uh, Shodan is one of those ways. <laughs> 
All right, y'all. Well, uh, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, it was a pleasure as usual. And uh, yeah, hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Goodbye, friends. Goodbye.